you uh, haven't been here the last few weeks, you may not know this, but we are in the book of Philippians. And we're having some fun in Philippians, or at least I'm having some fun in Philippians, and I hope you are as well. And if you've got a Bible, feel free to open to Philippians 3, or if you've got an iPhone or iPad or something electronic and it's got a Bible in it, hey, I'm all for it. If it's God's Word, open it up and let's use it. So I'm going to spend most of the day here looking at Philippians. I'm going to touch a little points on uh, the book of Acts. We do have a Wednesday afternoon Bible study where we've been walking through the book of Acts, and there's a nice intersection today where kind of Acts and and uh, Philippians come together a little bit, and so I'll point those points out a little bit for you if you would like to see that. And so we are examining our perspectives, and we're hoping as we walk our way through the book of Philippians that God would give us, basically, a new perspective, that he would open our eyes in new ways, that we would see Scripture in ways we've not seen before, that through that, God would inspire us and challenge us and change us that we might go and change the world. And the title of this sermon today is going to be Faith, Not Rules. Well, some of you might know this, a few of you at least. My dad is by trade a motorcycle mechanic. Uh, As a young boy, I grew up um, in a motorcycle shop. Uh, My dad still works on motorcycles on the side. He's got, uh, if you've ever seen them, my dad has airlift benches, in fact, two of them in his garage. Um, My parents, when they built the garage, built the garage bigger than the house in which they live. And they built this garage, oh, 1985, I want to say. And they're in the process of reciting their house at the very moment. And in all of the years that they've lived in this house, and in all of the years that they've had this garage, only one winter was there enough room in that garage for a car to park. (laughs) Not because it's full of junk, it's full of motorcycles. Okay. In fact, yesterday, my dad bought another motorcycle. My mom and dad are on vacation in Branson, Missouri. They rode from Sioux Falls, South Dakota, down there on their motorcycle. And on the internet, my dad bought in Waite Park, down by St. Cloud, another motorcycle that he's got to drive up and buy next weekend, I guess. So he loves motorcycles, and, and he's, he's fantastic at it. He, he runs a prison now professionally. He, he, he's one of the overseers of the South Dakota State Penitentiary. But his love, his passion is motorcycles, right? And, and, and he works on them. He's worked on them for all of my life, since before I was even born, in fact. He's worked in motorcycle shops. And, and, and he's really, really good at it. Now, he went to school in California way back when I was maybe three or four years old. He went to a Honda school. My dad's a Honda certified gold mechanic, which is the highest level of mechanic you can become by Honda certification. And so he knows his stuff. And, and, and he is so good at stuff. It honestly almost freaks me out occasionally. Because I can literally call my dad on the phone and say, it's making this sound and it's doing this. And he'll say, this, this, and this is your problem. This, this, and this is how you fix it. And I'll go do this, this, and this. And sure enough, he was right. He, he's the kind of guy, like, if you pull up in my dad's driveway on your motorcycle and you tell him, this thing isn't running right, he can just stand there for a minute and listen to it and listen to what you describe the problems are, and more than likely, (coughs) in just a matter of seconds, he can diagnose exactly what's wrong with your bike, and he can even go so far as to tell you exactly what it needs to fix it and how long it will take him to do it, and and probably what it's going to cost you on top of it, because he's pretty familiar with parts prices. So he's good. He's freakishly good. He's amazingly good. He loves working on motorcycles. He loves to diagnose things. He loves, this really is weird to me, he loves working on electrical problems. He, he's like an electrical problem guru in motorcycles. If you've got wiring problems, he can figure them out. I mean, if you've ever read or if you've ever seen Sherlock Holmes, my dad is like the motorcycle equivalent of Sherlock Holmes. He sees things that we don't, right? I ride my bike and I know when it's broken, And that's kind of the end of it. And I used to work with him in the motorcycle shop. But he, on the other hand, he's able to see things. He perceives things. He hears things. But particularly sees things in a motorcycle that just go right by any one of us. Now, skills are incredibly important because what he has experienced determines what he sees. 
He knows what he's looking for. He knows where to look, right? Years and years and years of training, lots and lots of hard work in the shop and in his garage have made him an expert in this field. Now today, we are going to see the Apostle Paul was talking to some people in a church that he loved dearly. And it was actually a church that he started in roughly 52 AD. And, and it was a church that, because of his experiences in ministry and his experiences in his life, Paul was able to also see some things that they were unable to see. Okay? Now, Paul is an incredibly interesting story, of course. Paul had perhaps experienced more sinfulness of man than most people alive will ever experience. I mean, Paul himself says, I am the chief of sinners, right? And not only had Paul experienced this tremendous depth of mankind's sin, I mean, he was stoned and left for dead. He was run out of town. He was whipped. He was beaten. He was, he was betrayed. I mean, just, you go on down the list, and Paul knew about man's sin, right? You read his stories before, probably. But not only did he know about man's sinfulness, Paul knew greatly about God's goodness as well. He knew more about God's goodness probably than anybody alive as well. And because of his experiences, Paul was able to see things that other people did not see. Now, if you were here in previous weeks, you may remember that Paul was writing to the Philippian church from a Roman prison, right? He'd always wanted to go to Rome, he said. But he was thinking a little more, with a little more freedom, right? He, he wanted to go there and preach. He wanted to go there and maybe see some of the sights, see some of the people, do some of the things. But instead, when Paul goes to Rome, he goes to Rome as a prisoner. Not a preacher, but instead in prison. Something most of us would say, man, that's terrible. That's horrible, right? I don't want to go to prison, and I particularly don't want to go to a Roman prison. Not a place you want to be. But instead of being a preacher, he finds himself a prisoner. And, but because of it, he's going to have a different perspective. And in those moments, he's going to see some things that others might miss. Here's what he says in Philippians 3.1. He says this. He says, Finally, my brothers, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same things to you is no trouble to me, and it is safe with you. What Paul realized is that there were some people there who, who were vulnerable, in fact, to the lies of Satan. There were a lot of new Christians. When Paul had first gone to the Philippian church and, and helped them get up and running, um, he, he had to leave them um, and, and go to the next place, but he had to leave them, as he often did, with some trials and troubles that seem to follow Paul across his ministry. But he's able to see, looking back at where they are at, uh, there's some vulnerable Christians there. And so he speaks some wisdom into their lives. Paul saw the danger of some different things that the Philippian Christians could unknowingly slip into. And he wanted to present to them the truth to give them a, a safeguard to protect them. So let me give you a, a little bit more of the backstory to help you understand what all was going on. When Jesus came and, and he died and he rose again, the first century believers were taking the message of the gospel out. And this is where this intersects with our Wednesday Bible study in Acts. Jesus lived, died, rose again, and, and, and the Christian believers kind of gather together. Then they have the day of Pentecost. Peter gets up and preaches. People start hearing the word of God in their language. They flock. They become Christians. And the church starts to grow. And again and again, we see early in the book of Acts where Luke is writing that God adds to their numbers. They grow. God's blessing is upon this early church. And those that are coming and becoming followers of Christ are largely of Jewish origin. Okay? So, so as we read the early part of Acts, uh, in fact, Acts 1 through 7, for the most part, you see the gospel go out, but it goes out among the Jews. Well then, in the next chapter of Acts, we see the gospel get out to the Samaritans, right? Or the Samaritans, sorry. It gets out to the Samaritans. And so, if you don't know the Samaritans' background, they were half Jew, half Gentile. 
And, and because of some things that are going on in Jerusalem, it starts to push some of the Christians out, and they end up there spreading the gospel. So now you've got the Jews, now you've got the half-Jews and half-Gentiles that have received the gospel. Well, then when you get to Acts 10, there we find some beginning to take the gospel to the Gentiles. Okay? In fact, this is even before Paul is doing it. And, and so there's others out taking the gospel early in Acts 10, and they're taking the gospel not only to the Jews, not only to the half-Jews, but to the full Gentiles as well. And this creates some tension, and this creates some problems among the believers. Because the Jews come into it with this rich, deep, Old Testament spiritual background, right? And these Jews are so used to a really strict system of laws. Really strict system of rules. This is exactly what you must do, when you must do it, if you want to be a believer. That's how Judaism worked. And all of a sudden, these new believers that are Jewish converts, they're looking at all these incoming Gentiles, and they're going, hold on, no, 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 wait a minute, wait, 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 wait. These gen Gentiles can't just come in and join the club, right? That's too easy. They can't just come in and become Christians right away. They first have to become Jewish. And they have to then follow the Jewish law. And then once they follow the Jewish law, then they are ready and worthy to follow Jesus. Okay? Then they're ready to become Christians. And one of their key points of argument, this goes way back into the Old Testament, was this belief among these people that these incoming Gentiles needed to be circumcised. Okay? That's, that's a big deal. For the Jews who had converted to Christianity, this is, this is a huge issue. And this causes all sorts of tension. This causes all kinds of headaches. In fact, this causes problems for Paul from basically the very beginning to the very end of his ministry. This problem plagues Paul wherever he goes for the large part. And in short, what the problem is, just the problem is they wanted to be circumcised, but the problem really is that they wanted them to follow the Jewish law first to become a Christian. So this leads to a big debate. We actually just talked about it this week in our Wednesday Bible study. This leads to a big, big debate within the church, and they gather together all of the big shots, the big Christian leaders. Paul, Barnabas, they come all the way to Jerusalem. They were over ministering in the northern Mediterranean, right? They come all the way back to Jerusalem. Peter comes back. James is there. They have a council, okay? They get together. These big Christian apostles put their heads together and have a conference. It's called the Conference of Jerusalem. And they battle it out to determine, okay, here's officially what we believe. This is officially what we're going to do. The official ruling, they decide, is you don't first have to become Jewish. And you don't have to follow Jewish law. You don't have to get circumcised to become a Christian. And all of a sudden, when they finally come to that one accord, it says in Scripture, when they all come to agreement, unanimous agreement, all of a sudden it frees up Paul to go and, and just do tremendous ministry. And Paul and the others go back out with the full authority of the church behind them saying, all you need is Christ to be right with God. All you need is Jesus. And this was a revolutionary thing in those days. Now, you might think at that point that the debate would be settled, right? All the big religious people, the important people had made up their minds, they'd made the call. But unfortunately for Paul, as I mentioned, it doesn't go that simply. There was this group, they were known as the Judaizers. Uh, this group that was just a thorn in Paul's flesh, frankly. And they would not give up on the circumcision issue. They wanted people to jump through hoops. They wanted people to follow rules to become Christians. But in keeping with the theme of what we've been studying in Philippians, Paul has a different perspective because of what he himself had experienced. And in that, then, he sees dangers that the others in the church weren't seeing. And so he wanted to help the church see the three primary dangers that I find in this passage this week. Three things that they needed to be aware of, to look out for. 
Well, what are they? If you're taking notes, they're in your sermon notes there. Uh, The first one is you need to see the dangers of legalism. He says this in a little bit different words, but he says this to the church in Philippi. You need to be careful. You need to be cautious. You need to look out for legalism. Now you might say, well, what is legalism, right? My most simple definition for legalism is this. It's simply substituting rules for relationship. Legalism is substituting rules for relationship. Okay, does that make sense? It's saying that I'm going to be made right with God by what I do or what I don't do, the ways in which I follow the law, not by my relationship. Now, they could be biblical rules. It could be man-made rules. It could be Jewish rules. It could be rules of any church, any denomination, whether you're Baptist or Assemblies of God or Catholic or Lutheran or Methodist or whatever. But if we are substituting rules for relationship with God, then our system of worship and our system of faith is broken. And this is what Paul says then in verse 2. He says to the Philippians, he says, he says look out for dogs. Look out for evildoers and look out for those who might mutilate the flesh. And if you don't know the history in the background, Paul's taking a jab at these Judaizers. He's calling them dogs. Well, why is that offensive? Well, dogs were unclean. First of all, dogs, I mean, you know, they were the ones I talked about earlier in Scripture that go eat their own vomit, right? Dogs weren't, weren't, weren't looked as highly and prized as we do in America. And to this day, if you go to the Middle East, dogs are unclean animals. Okay? And so they looked down upon dogs largely. I mean, dogs served a purpose, but they weren't house pets. And so Paul looks at the Judaizers, and he calls them dogs. Well, you know who the Jews normally called dogs? The Jews used to call the Gentiles dogs, because they were unworthy. They were beneath the Jews. See, the Jews had a, a little bit of a big head about who they were because they were chosen by God. They were God's chosen people. We were somebody special. Everybody else, if you're not somebody special, you're nothing. You're a dog. Paul comes along. Paul who used to be Saul. Paul who used to be super Jew, right? Paul comes along and he says, no, you guys are the dogs. And not only are you dogs, they're evildoers. He says, look out for them. Not only are they evildoers, they will not mutilate, right? Mutilate's not a thing you want. You don't want to have mutilated flesh. Paul knows that in Jesus, it's about circumcision of our hearts, not of the flesh. It's not cutting of the bodies that matter to God, but it's the changing of our hearts, the transformation of our spirit that God is concerned with. Verse 3. For we are the circumcision who worship by the Spirit of God and the glory in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh. So confidence, folks, isn't what we do. It's not in human efforts. Our confidence is in God. And then in verses 4 through 6, he lays down why Paul is exceptionally qualified to be telling them about how to go about living out their faith. If you look at verse 5, he says roughly this. This is kind of a summary. He says, he says, listen up, Philippians. You know me, but let me remind you, Philippians. Here's my story, right? Paul says, I was circumcised on the eighth day, as it should be, the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, right? He's giving his lineage, the tribe of Benjamin. I was a Hebrew of Hebrews. And in regards to the law, Paul says, I was a Pharisee. As for zeal, man, I was out persecuting the church. As for legal righteousness, I was as good as it gets. Paul says, I was faultless. So in other words, what Paul is saying is, I was born to the right group. I was in the elite of the elite. As a Pharisee, he was saying, I obeyed all the laws. And I obeyed more laws than you did. I'm better than you. I obeyed more laws than you probably even could count, is basically what Paul's saying. And he says, not only did I obey the laws, I obeyed them better than you. I got it all right. Paul says, I was an amazing Jew. 
And whatever you might have that you can bring to the table spiritually, as far as spiritual credibility, says, Paul says, I can one-up it. Right? Paul says, I can do you one better. You're not going to beat me in who's who, who's the best at following God. Paul knows he can crush it with his experiences, anything you might try to argue. And now it's a, a bit funny and a bit sad that we too can fall into this Judaizer trap ourselves if we're not careful. We do this, you know. When we fall into the Judaizer trap, when we come to a place where we begin to judge non-Christians by our Christian standards. This is a big deal. It never ceases to amaze me, frankly, how bent out of shape some Christians can get when the world lives like the world, right? Their standard is not our standard. And frankly, it's silly for us to expect them to live like we live when they don't believe like we believe. And I'll tell you this truth. This is an important truth. One of the key issues that keeps non-believers from ever wanting to come to church is because if they feel like you've already judged them, if they feel like they don't measure up, if they feel like they don't even, they're never going to qualify even to get into the club, well, then why would they ever come, Right? If they think that you've already decided that they're not good enough, why would they ever come to church? Right? And they do feel that way oftentimes. We impose our beliefs on people who don't share them. And because of it, we alienate. Sometimes our subtle and, and not so subtle comments and actions become legalism rather than love. And that's not how you win people to Christ. Legalism leads to guilt. Guilt when we do something wrong, right? And it leads to a, a false confidence. So many people beat themselves up. So many people are lacking in joy because they've failed. They know they've failed, right? They don't need you to come along and kick them when they're down. They already know that they've screwed up and made the mistake. How does you piling on help them come to know Christ? They need your love. But there's so many people walking around in our world wounded, broken. I see them. Do you see them? Carrying all kinds of junk and baggage behind them. Stuff that they're just dragging. And it's killing them. They want freedom, but they don't know where to find it. And when they come to us, they may know we're Christians, sometimes instead of finding freedom, they find guilt and condemnation. Is that going to work? Is that going to help? I don't think it is. That's legalism. Now the flip side of the coin, and one of the points in which Paul is making is that legalism can also bring a false confidence. You know, the, hey, look at me. I'm better than you, right? I go to the right church, right? I go to a better church than your church. My worship is the right way. The way we do it is the right way. Everybody else is wrong, right? That false confidence is equally as bad. Folks, we are all sinners, in need of a Savior. Some of us, thankfully, have met that Savior. But let us not erect barriers to outsiders. And let us not pretend that we have it all figured out because we're already in the club. Beware of legalism. The second thing that Paul warns about in this passage is he tells us to see the dangers of worldly distractions. Paul says this in verses 7 and verses 8. 
But whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake, Paul says, for the sake of Jesus, I have suffered the loss of all things. And I count them yet as rubbish in order that I might gain Christ. Folks, Paul had it all. I don't know how well you know Paul's background, but Paul had it all. He had the best teachers. He went to the best schools. He had the best friends. He had family with money. He was rising through the ranks, right? He was a star in the making. People knew him. He was going places. He was a rising star. And Paul walked away from all of it after an encounter with Jesus walking down a road to Damascus with the intent to round up Christians to kill them making him even better in the eyes of the Jews Jesus comes and Jesus changes and transforms Paul's heart and let this phrase sink in Paul says, everything else, everything other than Jesus is a loss compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ Jesus as my Lord. And it is here that Paul uses one of the strongest words you will find in all of Scripture to describe the value of everything else in this world. Most translated as rubbish. You'll see I've put it in your notes there. The scubula, right? That's a Greek word. This is one of the strongest words that you will find throughout Scripture. And and if you wanted to get kind of the feeling of what Paul is angling towards here when he says rubbish, he says, everything of this world, everything that I had, everything that I've done, everything that's not Jesus is dung. It's excrement. It's garbage. It's filth. It's vile. It's worthless. It's pointless. That is what Paul is saying. He says, I'm giving up all that worthless dung that I might gain Christ. I consider them all a loss compared to knowing the greatness of Christ Jesus my Lord. Everything I thought was important, Paul says, is no longer important. Our priorities so quickly get out of whack if we're not careful right? It happens. The things of this world begin to pull our attention away. And Paul reminds us, he says, hey folks, big neon letters. The stuff of this world, it doesn't really matter. Christ matters. That's what matters. Let's read on in verse 9. It says there that, and be found in him, not having righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ. The righteousness from God that depends upon faith, that I may know Him in the power of His resurrection and may share His sufferings. How did Jesus suffer? Oh boy, did He suffer. Becoming like Him in death. That by any means possible I may attain the resurrection from the dead. Did you catch that? Paul is saying it's not by the law in which we are saved. It's by faith. We are only made right with God through faith. And God's goodness is so much better than the things of this world that we try to put our hope and trust in. Our bank accounts, our retirement, our homes, how good our kids are going to do at school, how nicely we mow our lawn, how good our truck looks, how big or fast our bass boat is. Right? Those things are going to save us. There's your jewelry collection, your shoe collection, the new gun you got. Are they going to save you? Well, a gun might save you from a bear, but that's not the kind of saving we're talking about. Will they save your soul eternally? 
Paul's saying, it's not by the law that we are saved, but it's by faith. And God's goodness is so much better than the things of this world that we try to put our hope and trust in. The third and final thing I'm going to point out to you today is that Paul is warning about in chapter 3 is something that I believe many of us struggle with. You may not be struggling with it now, but at some point in your faith walk, you probably will. And that thing is spiritual complacency. We get spiritually lazy, complacent. I mean, it's easy to come to church, right? To punch the time clock at church, to go home and repeat the next week. And then to do it to the next week, and they do it the next week, and they do it the next week, and they do it for the next 40 or 50 years. You just, you, 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 you feel like you might have done something, but we've really not done something spiritually. And instead of growing in faith, we just find ourselves walking through the motions, and we come walking in like zombies, right? We, we go walking back out like zombies. We haven't been transformed. We're just, uh, our brains are off, and we were here. We punched the clock. We, we did our time, right? We, we were here but we were spiritual zombies, aimlessly trudging forward, step after mindless step, right? And this is especially dangerous, folks, here in America, because we're so blessed. It's easy to become complacent. It's easy to be lazy spiritually, because we're so blessed. We have what we need for the most part. We're not persecuted, right? Life is good and church is easy. So we just hit the spiritual cruise control button, put everything on autopilot. Everything is A-OK. And I believe this is one of the very most dangerous things in our churches, in our part of the world. Spiritual complacency. People who become complacent in their relationships, in their marriage, and don't care about honoring God. It's raising spiritually complacent children who are more concerned about how many points they scored this week during their game than they are about how they grew spiritually. It's about becoming spiritually complacent in our giving, consuming more things, having more stuff, bigger, better, stronger, faster. Right? Once upon a time, it was keeping up with the Johnsons. But now it's beating the Johnsons. Mine has to be better. And so we consume more and we give less. We get busy, but we're not doing things that matter. Spiritually, we begin to flatline. We're not caring, and we're not even satisfied, but we don't care about it. And Paul is saying, watch out. Don't become spiritually complacent. Remember, this is what he's saying to us from prison. <coughs> Paul's on house arrest, waiting for a judgment, and the judgment may be for his execution. And he writes this in verse 12. He says, not that I have already obtained this, or that I am already perfect, but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. And then he says in verses 13 and 14, Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind, straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on towards the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Paul says, if you've experienced what I've experienced, you're going to see what I've seen. You're going to see the faithfulness of God. And when I was beaten, Paul said, God did not leave me. When I was left for dead after being stoned, Paul says, they took rocks and they threw them at me and they thought I was dead. Right? And it's pretty easy to tell if somebody's alive or dead. How many rocks do you think it takes when you throw out somebody's head until... They look dead. That's the condition Paul was in. And even in that moment, Paul says, as I was stoned and left for dead, I still saw the goodness of God. And that God in that 
lifted me spiritually. Paul says, I've seen the unfaithfulness of men. They've turned against me. I had the dream, Paul says, of coming to Rome as a preacher, but instead I'm coming to Rome as a prisoner. But here's the deal, Paul says. You can lock me up, but you can't shut me up. I'm pressing on. I'm continuing. As long as I've got a pen in my hand, as long as there's paper before me, as long as there is breath in my lungs, Paul says, I will preach the gospel. Paul says, you can lock me up to four different guards a day. And guess what I'm going to do? I'm going to convert them all to Jesus. One by one by one. They can't get away. Paul sees being chained to another guy, not as a burden, but as a joy. Paul sees it as a joy, satisfied with what he has, but not satisfied with what he's done. And he says, I press on, I press on, I press on. So I believe that God wants to speak to us through this text. He wants us to see the dangers of legalism. Don't get all wrapped up in, here's what I do and here's what I don't do. That's dangerous because we'll miss out on the power of knowing Christ if we do that and knowing Him personally. Don't substitute rules for relationship. And don't get distracted by a bunch of earthly rubbish either. Don't miss the glory of knowing the power of the resurrection of Christ because a bunch of earthly things took your focus off the cross. And don't get comfortable spiritually. My last thought for you today, if you're not dead, you're not done. God still has something in store for you. God has you for a reason. God has you for a purpose. If you're not dead, you're not done. Get in the game. So as you go forth this week, as you go into the world, as you leave out these doors, live life differently, folks. Love radically this week. Make much of Jesus everywhere that you go. And then see just how God might use you. You never know. Something amazing might and likely will happen. Go and be faithful. Go and love radically. Go and love like Jesus loved you first. Amen. Let's pray.